Oh, it's one of three. I'll, I'll go ahead and should we start us up, Dr. Halverson? Are you ready? Please, yeah. Okay, I'll speak first and then I will hand this over to Dr. Halverson. Uh, I am Peter Schwartz. I am the director of the IU Center for Bioethics and of the Bioethics and Subject Advocacy Program of the Indiana CTSI. And this is our next uh, TREATS talk, Translational Research Ethics Applied Topics. Uh, we do these roughly monthly, uh, even during a pandemic. Uh, and although this was planned before the pandemic, and so it really is not related to the pandemic, although perhaps Dr. Haverson will make some links for us. Uh, it's my pleasure to present this topic. These are supposed to be short introductions to issues in ethics and research, uh, really helpful to people doing research who might uh, need a primer and then some direction to where to go for extra help. And so uh, Dr. Halverson is an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine uh, at the Center for Bioethics. Uh, he has a PhD from University of Chicago in linguistic anthropology and uh, both training there at University of Chicago in medical ethics and a postdoctoral fellowship at Vanderbilt. And he is our uh, newest addition to the Center for Bioethics and a great addition and to the Bioethics and Subject Advocacy Program. And he brings a tremendous amount of experience with ethnographic research, or I may be using the term wrong, but what I think of as ethnographic research and certainly the ethics of that. And so I'm thrilled that he will be speaking to us today on ethnographic research. And as I'm speaking, I am now enthralled with not just the topic, but with whatever that effect is, which the slide is doing as I am looking at it. I feel like maybe I had MSG at lunch or something because the world is moving. <laughs> Um, other than that, I'm good. Dr. Haverson, take it away. Thank you very much, Dr. Schwartz. Um, thank you, everybody, for being with us in this kind of odd setting. Um, I'm going to do my best with Zoom. Uh, so like Peter said, my name is Colin Halverson. I am uh, new to Indiana University, still relatively, um, but not necessarily new to the field of ethics, although my training, uh, again, is in uh, anthropology. Um, so here on the screen, you can see uh, two of my recent publications that kind of show the, the difference or divergence in uh, kind of my career trajectory, um, but also show the overlap between the uh, interests on the ethics side on the right, and then the linguistic anthropology side on the left. Um, what I'm talking about today, ethnographic method, is what you're trained in in anthropology, um, but it's used in a number of different fields, uh, although I think probably people still think of anthropology as its home base. Um, the uh, over the course of this talk, I hope that you can see both where uh, ethnography comes from, um, but also how it can be applied in healthcare research um, and in situations probably more familiar to this audience. Um, so what is ethnography? Uh, so first off, I want to say what ethnography is not. Ethnography is not just another name for qualitative research. Uh, or mixed methods, um, although I think you probably have encountered it used in that way. Uh, ethnography is uh, really about a detailed observation of a specific community. Um, the phrase thick description is often attributed to the anthropologist Clifford Gertz as a way of describing the ideal form of uh, an ethnography, uh, which is both a method or a process and the word that you use for the end result. So like a book or a text that's produced um, through ethnography is also called an ethnography, which is a little confusing. Um, ethnography is a scientific observation of behavior and its context, um, and the and its context part of that definition is really key. Ethnography is holistic, um, and it includes the local subjective interpretations of the behaviors being observed, um, not just those of the analyst or the researcher, um, and the end result gives a, a broad picture of a culture, society, or other social organization. Um, another key aspect of ethnography that I think differentiates it from other forms of investigation is that ethnography really does try to uh, be charitable and sensitive 
toward the object of its study and the people being studied. Um, it places the actions under observation within their local interpretations and uh, motives in order to explain and perhaps even better predict uh, behavior in the future. Um, and the, this charity is really important because it's not necessary for an ethnographer to identify with or to uh, even enjoy the presence of uh, his or her interlocutors. Um, so there have been some very interesting uh, ethnographies done with cannibals um, and headhunters in um, Papua New Guinea and uh, lowland Amazonia, um, and also in organized uh, crime communities in the United States. Um, the, the ethnographer obviously does not have to uh, agree with the morality of the actions of his or her subjects, but does have to place those actions within the um, political economy and symbolic orders of the subjects uh, being uh, studied. Uh, so that is to say, there's this phrase that you probably have heard, going native, which has historically been tied to anthropology. It is absolutely not necessary for the ethnographer to go native, um, although it is um, particularly interesting, I think, when you read an ethnography um, that in which the ethnographer has fully engaged with the local system, uh, cultural system. And a great example of this is my personal favorite anthropologist, E.E. E. Evans Pritchard, uh, has a beautiful piece where he discusses the moment where he felt fully immersed in his study of witchcraft in Africa, where he says that he saw a bright light of witchcraft shoot across the field when he left his hut at night. Um, never again in, the, in his works does he ever actually say that he believes in witchcraft per se, um, but that kind of ability to switch perspectives and see the world the way that your, uh, that your research subjects do is a critical aspect of that portion of ethnography. Um, probably unsurprisingly then, to get that kind of a view, ethnography requires an embedding uh, in what we call field work um, for a long term. Um, so, that typically is at the very least a few months when you're doing your PhD work. That usually means at least a year. And some of my classmates have spent three or four years in the field before they complete their dissertation project. Um, this also means that you, before you even get to the field, uh, again, using our little lingo, um, you have to do extensive historical research and a literature review to understand a world that is not going to be one that you've necessarily encountered in your day-to-day -day life uh, previously. Um, another important aspect of ethnography is that it's interpretive and inductive. It focuses on situated and particular actions and cultures rather than uni making universal claims about those behaviors or motivations, and it's best thought of as a sort of case study. Uh, and from my perspective, uh, especially looking at ethnography in uh, the healthcare setting, the uh, greatest advantage of it um, is that it has the ability to make the everyday seem foreign. Um, and so an ethnographic view or an eth ethnographic perspective on a healthcare setting um, has the ability to scrutinize what can appear to people who engage with this world day to day as common sense, um, and it rejects everything as taken for granted. So, um, like I said, anthropology is kind of the uh, locus classicus of ethnography. Um, and here you see kind of canonical examples of ethnography uh, in its historical setting. On the left, um, you have Branislav Malinovsky in the Trebrian Islands, where he wrote his very famous uh, Argonauts of the South Pacific. And on the right, you have a Balinese cockfight, which was popularized in a thick description account by Clifford Gertz, who I mentioned just a moment ago. Um, one of the great things about ethnography for 
the read actually is supposed to be enjoyable to read. Part of thick description. Um, it's uh, it's a way to get the audience to experience the world along with the ethnographer. Uh, and so for a student, it actually is very enjoyable to read these kinds of texts, especially in uh, opposition to more traditional dry or quantitative um, uh, studies that you might be more familiar with in healthcare. So I'm gonna throw out a few suggestions if you're interested in ethnographic works um, along with these two uh, on the screen. Uh, there's also Coming of Age in Samoa by Margaret Mead, which is fantastic. Uh, I think possibly my favorite ethnography of all time is Colin Turnbull's The Forest People. Uh, and then Evans Pritchard, whom I mentioned before, has uh, great witchcraft oracles and magic among the Azande. Uh, another aspect of especially anthropological uses of ethnography is uh, a kind of self-critical uh, awareness um, because ethnography is interpretive, uh, a good ethnography is always very aware of the positionality of the ethnographer, him or herself, and the limitations that that perspective places on the ethnographer's ability to see the world in the way that his or her subjects do. Um, and so two books along that line that I'm going to recommend that I think are very interesting. One that I just finished actually for the first time, Claude Lévi-Strauss, a name probably familiar to a lot of you, uh, has this great confessional called Tris Tropique about his time uh, doing work in Amazonia. Um, then actually one of my favorite ethnographies is called The Innocent Anthropologist, Notes from a Mud Hut by Nigel Barley. Um, which talks about his time doing research in Cameroon and the discomforts of living in a world completely unfamiliar to him before he stepped foot into it. But that is just the um, historical setting for ethnography. In more recent decades, ethnography has moved from uh, what used to be called exotic societies, small scale societies, non-Western uh, cultures, and has started turning the gaze, quote, inward, um, in particular uh, with the rise of medical anthropology, the use of ethnography in the healthcare system. I've got three books up right now, which are um, some of my favorite uh, uses of ethnography uh, in these instances. I'd recommend all of them to anyone, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. So what actually is ethnography and what are the methods it makes use of? In the classical mode or a more traditional anthropological mode, um, you can see here some probably not terribly useful uh, techniques for the study of medicine. Um, these elicita elicitation techniques and the objects of inquiry are definitely notably different um, between the works I was discussing just a moment ago and then the works of a medical anthropologist. Um, however, the kind of structuralist analyses that you see on the screen right now still do form the backbone of certain segments of anthropology, structuralist, structural functionalist anthropology, and for me, importantly, uh, the study of signs uh, with linguistic anthropology. So the kinds of stuff you see here um, still do have resonances uh, for people like me. More importantly, though, in understanding ethnography as it could be used in a healthcare setting, there are four primary techniques that I'm going to talk about. Uh, the first and most important one is uh, what we call participant observation. Um, and so this is a way for a researcher to gain access to expert or secretive practices through the participation in daily activity. Uh, and so this is the embedding part of it. Uh, the researcher actually um, engages with uh, his or her subjects in uh, an unmarked manner, uh, leading eventually ideally to that individual's acceptance within the community as 
quote, adoptive member. Um, and so then uh, this gives you kind of insight that you wouldn't have as uh, a more professional or um, uh, a, how would I say, like a, an observer with a cooler hand. Um, the second technique is formal and informal uh, interviews. Um, as I mentioned before, one of the key aspects of uh, ethnography is this critical self-awareness. And so ethnographic interviews are distinguished from other kinds of interviews um, in part by their keen awareness of the effects of the context of the interview. So both the interpersonal relationship between the two or more individuals, um, but also the effects that an interview set setting or an elicitation setting has on an ability on uh, an interviewee's ability to produce reliable um, data about their experiences. Something that I did not do during my dissertation work, but have done since, um, that I think is kind of less common in anthropological ethnographies, but still used uh, by other ethnographers is a survey, survey technique. Um, I'm not going to go into that much because it's not really my field, but it is a part of, um, it is a part of the, what people call mixed methods aspects of ethnography. Another thing that's kind of, um, on the edge of ethnography is the use of archives. Um, historians will do more of that um, and historical anthrop um, anthropologists working to ground their projects more in a historical trajectory will do more of that. I did a lot of work with documents though as a sort of archive um, with uh, textual analyses of um, patient education materials, which I'll talk about in just a moment. Uh, and so those are the four techniques that I want to highlight uh, before turning to a description of how I've used them in my work. Um, but then before doing that, I do also want to mention uh, a very important thing with the distinctive ethics involved in ethnographic research. Um, so here I say reflexivity uh, and representation. And what I mean by reflexivity here is that self-awareness. So the ethnographer always has to be aware of his or her own bias uh, and the limitations in what becomes available uh, to him or her in uh, the research. So a very clear example of that is uh, one of my professors uh, in the PhD program had previously done work on uh, use of taboo languages uh, in Aboriginal Australia. Um, the way that people use language uh, is highly gendered. And so as a man, he only had access to a certain range of language uses. Um, but then when his wife came to visit uh, and uh, sit in on some of these sessions, she was able to elicit a completely different range of uh, language behaviors. So being aware of those limitations uh, in that kind of very obvious sense, but also in a more nuanced sense, uh, always haunts the anthropologist or the ethnographer. Um, has, uh, and that awareness bleeds into the next thing, representation. Um, you both, as you represent your subjects, you have to be keenly aware of how your perspective has shaped um, your ability to represent them truly. But you also have to think about this deep dive that you've been able to go into, uh, the huge amount of time that you've spent with these people um, acclimating to the way that they experience the world. Um, and uh, if you, for instance, are working with cannibals, you have to think, okay, I've gotten to the point where I can understand how this works within their world, but how do I represent them in an honest fashion, uh, in a charitable way to, um, to a readership who hasn't spent this amount of time with them. Uh, and again, this doesn't require you to agree with anything that your interlocutors actually do, um, but the concern is how do you represent them in a way that's not just charitable from your perspective, but also the perspective of your audience. All right, so now I'll turn to a brief discussion of my work at Mayo Clinic um, between 2013 and 2015. 
uh, as I mentioned, I was embedded in the Center for Individualized Medicine, which is basically Mayo's branded version of personalized medicine. Um, I was actually very lucky, I think, in the way that I got embedded because I was actually employed as a researcher in their Center for Bioethics. This is very distinct from a lot of my uh, colleagues. Uh, anthropologists who are working in um, more traditional settings um, for anthropology. So while uh, I had a nine to five job during which I uh, collected my data, um, friends of mine who work in Sub-Saharan Africa or the Amazon uh, have to determine for themselves what a daily life looks like for their interlocutors. Um, so that's, I guess, one positive aspect of doing an ethnographic uh, project in a healthcare setting compared to a more traditional uh, form of ethnography. The, uh, there are a lot of ways, though, that my project was very similar to a more traditional anthropological project. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, my background really is in linguistics and anthropology. Um, I had taken several courses with med students, including a genetics course, and I'd worked as a research assistant in uh, ethics and medical genetics for three years at the time that I started my field work. Um, but still arriving in the, this new setting uh, entailed a steep learning curve for me. Um, so I, uh, for instance, learning a new language, in quotes, uh, learning the language of genetics, learning the language of medicine, um, and these kinds of new perspectives on the world, disease, uh, et cetera. Um, what I did practically in terms of my methods, I observed in board meetings, tumor board meetings, rare disease conferences, et cetera, I shadow genetic counselors and oncologists as I met with patients, um, and I participated in ethnographic research with my colleagues. Um, uh, which led to co-authorships, shared poster and panel presentations, etc. cetera. Um, and so this is a way that you can see the participant observation uh, technique in my methods. Um, it was not just that I was sitting in the corner like I did a lot of the time in the patient's uh, doctor-patient encounters, but I was actively engaging in the professional ecology of the hospital um, in doing the presentations, that was kind of the professional presentations was the first moment where I really felt my subjectivity shift. Um, the goals of uh, anthropology uh, and the production of an anthropological ethnography and those of uh, biomedicine are not um, isomorphic, are not perfectly aligned. And so getting my goals uh, to align, to get my work to make sense to clinicians uh, was a key aspect of that, um, that ethnographic transformation for me. Um, I also conducted a lot of interviews with doctors, patients, research scientists, and ethicists. These are both formal in the sense that we actually sat down in an office with an interview script that I recorded, um, and informal, which is kind of the uh, the dream of an anthropological um, project where you go beyond kind of the sterile professional relationship and develop actual friendships. Um, so leading to uh, more intimate settings uh, to discuss the work that's being done at Mayo Clinic over beer, over lunch, um, which allows you the kind of intimacy that you need uh, to actually appreciate the, the world from that holistic perspective. Um, and like I mentioned, I also did a lot of textual analysis of patient education documents. Um, and I also took the interviews as sorts of texts themselves that you could do a conversation analysis of. And I can talk about those things in more detail, but they're kind of, um, uh, they kind of could take their own course or at least a lecture uh, to describe. Um, so like I mentioned, 
my work was very similar in certain ways to a traditional ethnography in that I was learning a new language, I was tracing social networks, and I was um, observing the, the movement of materials uh, from clinic to lab to uh, diagnostic conference back to the patient. Um, and in fact, my intimate engagement with all these different aspects of the health of the medical genetics system at Mayo allowed me to write a dissertation that was read by a number of my informants of, or my uh, coworkers um, who said that they had not actually known all of those aspects of the project of the medical genetics project were going on uh, in their own daily work. Um, so this just gives you an example of how an ethnography actually can provide a more fulsome view of, for instance, a genetic testing process than any single member of the local community has on his or her own. Um, and now I want to turn to uh, discuss some, some of the ways that ethnography has been implemented in healthcare research uh, and provide a quick critique of how that's been done. Um, so one of the things that hopefully has become clear over this talk is that ethnography is not just about studying, quote, others, quote, culture. Um, so this isn't just a way to understand patients who come from a different socioeconomic or racial background, um, but it is also a way of understanding institutions and institutional processes as well. Um, ethnography tells you something not just about a particular hospital's culture, um, but about the culture outside that hospital that constructs it, maintains it, and patronizes it. Um, there have been very successful ethnographies of, uh, in healthcare that look at the beliefs and practices of patient populations, education and informal training of medical personnel, and the invisible utilization and impediments of the healthcare system by the general public. Ethnography is not merely the use of semi-structured interviews. It's not the same thing as qualitative, uh, qualitative uh, research in general. Um, uh, as I've already described, um, the rigor of ethnography is not the same thing as the rigor of quanti quantitative research. Um, and it doesn't require quantification to be rigorous. Um, and this, I think, is one of the places where its translation into the healthcare system gets difficult because for most healthcare workers um, and healthcare researchers, the type of method that's most familiar is quantitative. And so you see studies that come out that say that they're doing ethnographic work um, that treat the coding of interview and other ethnographic data inappropriately um, because they don't see the ways in which ethnographic work uh, is meant to be interpreted by its audience, treating it instead as no different from quantitative work. A phrase that I think is useful in uh, a similar regard is reflexivity over reproducibility. Uh, and one of the things that this means is that uh, most ethnographic work, because of the intensity and intimacy that it requires, has a very small sample size. Um, my work at Mayo Clinic was, I think, more extensive than most. I did over 100 interviews, uh, which is a lot more than I think what you'd see from a normal ethnography um, published in a medical journal. Uh, and more than, I, uh, more than you would have needed to do. I just had the time. Um, the key part of this is that generalizability is not the same for, for ethnographic research as it is for other types of methods. Um, it is only generalizable within its context of the ethnography because like I mentioned before, it is holistic and the context is a part of the analysis. Um, then another thing that is, so I wanna to touch on a couple of limitations and the sample size is not so much a limitation uh, as it is a caution in how you interpret the data and how you present it. One limitation though is um, in order to get this kind of intimacy, 
requires a lot of access. And in a healthcare setting, you run into obstacles uh, in accessing patients uh, and busy doctors. I, for instance, would have dreamed of recording doctor-patient inter interactions, which became too difficult as a student trying to navigate the IRB um, for very reasonable uh, ethical reasons. Um, there's also the concerns about how you represent your subjects and the types of thick description you can give. Um, because you also have to be concerned about intellectual property and exposure to liability. That said, one of the uh, books that I mentioned earlier goes into extensive detail and other clinicians, they didn't see harm in the way that it was presented. So you can still do that in a thoughtful way. And it's also not unique to the medical context. Um, for instance, one of my friends works with the Haida, uh, which is a tribe. He works in British Columbia. And the tribe technically has ownership out of, of all the data that he gathers and produces. And so the tribal council has to meet before he can publish anything, which delayed the publication of his book and his tenure case uh, by three years. So even in a more traditional anthropological setting, that's always a concern with ethnography. The other thing that's kind of unique to uh, ethnography, the limitations of ethnography in a healthcare setting is in terms of who can do an ethnography. Because of the long duration required by field work, uh, it's, which is necessary for an individual to be accepted uh, and become intimately familiar with the personnel in the context being investigated, um, Ethnography may be inappropriate and even impossible for researchers who also have intense clinical duties. Um, and my final comment on all of this before I close is just to say, uh, recently in a nursing journal, there was an article that was published that claimed to have done an ethnography of a VA hospital. Um, when you read the methods section, what they actually did was the group of researchers flew in to the hospital and spent two days where they conducted informal conversations uh, with clinicians and patients. Uh, like I said, two days later, they flew out and they wrote up their study. Uh, hopefully after hearing this entire talk, you can see what could have been gained from a more serious ethnography in that type of a setting and also see um, how, that, how what they called an ethnography uh, could mislead audiences both in thinking how to interpret their data and also in thinking what ethnography is itself. Thank you very much. That's my talk. Outstanding. Okay, thanks, uh, Colin, so much. So, uh, people with questions, we have the lovely tool of Zoom here. So, you can raise your hands. I'll let Colin uh, call on you. Do you have that, that window open, Colin? Can you do that? Um, I've just learned how to do this window I, myself. I do have a window. I don't know. Well, I participants don't under view. Everybody. You and manage participants. You can scan down. Luckily, if you raise your hand, you go to the very top of the window. So he, you always see them, even if you don't have all the many people here. So anybody with questions, challenges, thoughts, um, requests, remember everything that happens here gets... Uh, uh, recorded and um, and gets posted on our on our Treats Talk website, so people can go back to refer. Uh, but I, I see TJ Colin, so Dr. Casperbauer, I'll call on first. I'll leave the next uh, step to you, uh, Colin. Great, I do see it now. Yeah. Hey, Colin. I had a question about um, if you had thoughts on the types of problems that would be good for ethnographic research particularly about whether they're novel or emerging. It's like with, um, uh, you know, return of results or genetic counseling sorts of things. Would it be more appropriate or more interesting to do it on something that's a little more established? Um, or when it's newer? Or is that just not the right way to think about ethnography? So for instance, uh, an ethnography of genetic counseling now versus when it first started, uh, would one of those be more appropriate or, or valuable? 
That's a great question. There are actually two really interesting early ethnographies of, uh, of genetic counseling that I can think of right off the top of my head, both of which I thought were really successful. Um, one of them by Charles Bosk, who uh, wrote um, Forgive and Remember, which is the one that I just mentioned with the M&M &M &M conferences, also wrote about the development of a genetic counseling program in its early days um, called All of God's Mistakes. Um, and then uh, later, there is also Rainer Rapp has an ethnography of genetic counseling in prenatal care. And I can't think of its name off the top of my head. But I think both of those were successful, even in a more kind of inchoate stage of genetic counseling. Um, and then mine obviously was functionally also uh, um, also uh, an ethnography of genetic counseling. So I don't think the, the establishment so actually, this is what I'll say about that, is one of the critiques of early anthropology that I think is normally unfair is that it presents societies as if they're unchanging. Um, I don't think that good early ethnographies did that. Um, and I certainly don't think that ethnographies in the last couple of decades have been doing that as people become more aware of that uh, as a concern. The idea that something is established, I think is actually troubled by a good ethnography. Um, I think one of the goals of especially anthropology is to look at the ways that structure is constantly produced and manifested in practice. Uh, so yes, I don't, think, I don't think that limits what would be a good ethnographic object. Um, I do see that there are some comments in the chat, which I wasn't looking at before when I was full screen. Um, These darn millennials, they, they, they want to communicate with you by typing and speech as if you could do both. But um, if you read down through this, a couple of questions about the IRB, uh, one mm -hmm. question or two, and there's another, uh, yes, thank you. Yes, uh, Hardsock is actually a Zoomer, so don't let her tell you that. But um, anyway, so, um, about IRB issues, do, do these studies come through the IRB? Should they? Uh, there have been issues there as far as you see them. And then somebody also asked, Shelley also asked um, uh, the titles you mentioned, I think in your examples earlier about um, medical anthropology uh, and uh, example. I know we can always post those on the website with the talk, especially if you email individuals after this talk. But go ahead, uh, Con, first about the IRB, how about? Or Jane can ask herself now that she's come live, like the Zoomer she is. Hi, Jane. I uh, was raised on the um, Nine Inch Nails and Pixies. I am firmly Gen X. But, um, but no, so my question is, I heard you talking about, especially what we might think of in ethics as some particularly vulnerable populations. So I'm thinking of like in, um, uh, indigenous populations. You mentioned cannibals. Um, the pictures that you show of um, distinctly Caucasian people in the midst of these um, uh, settings. And so, um, and then you're mentioning the, the, the research that claimed to be ethnography and perhaps maybe was not. And whether, um, what you, whether you have some certain view on um, whether there should be review or IRB or protocol or those kinds of things that, that might catch that stuff. I'm sure there's a certain freedom in there not being IRB approval of ethnographic research, but um, what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, so I, first I will say historically there has, well, historically there was no oversight. Then there was oversight and now who knows again with the, the new common rule, my friends who are in anthropology departments are discussing whether or not, like for instance, I have a friend who's teaching a master's seminar and she has a student who wants to do research um, with the homeless population in Chicago. And uh, there's a debate right now about whether or not you actually need to have IRB approval to do that work. Uh, I think for so many reasons, there absolutely should be IRB approval, um, not least of all, because uh, it's, a, it's a very vulnerable population, even if it is just for a master's thesis. Um, the very interesting thing historically 
I mean, historically, there's a huge critique to be made about colonialism and how that interfaces with with ethnography as a practice and all all other forms of like knowledge acquisition. Um, but in more contemporary anthropological work, so like my friends who still work in um, like these very small scale communities, illiterate communities in Highland Papua New Guinea or like lowlands of Amazonia, there even if there is an IRB approving the research, there's a huge question about what do these people actually understand of what's going on if they don't uh, speak a majority language, they haven't had any kind of uh, formal education. Um, the inter like one of the kind of uh, hilarious things that you learn in field methods and linguistics is the interview set setting is very foreign to a lot of people, not just the people who have never watched an interview on TV before. And so the idea of research and the types of relationships entailed in research, uh, I don't think that IRBs are even equipped to address those kinds of concerns. Thank you. That that's that's helpful. I actually taught um, uh, ethnography to my um, uh, students this morning, my final class to my medical humanities. Students this morning. Oh, I wish I had had this beforehand. <laughs> uh, thank you. You're welcome. Um, and I do see the the questions about titles. Um, I can read those off again now if people think that's most helpful, or we can just post them and then you can actually see them with the names of the the authors. I think maybe the we do that to save time and, and we'll have actually yeah. um, anybody who wants they can send a message in they want the titles or we can also send an email just to the whole group who've attended because it's actually unlike usual we actually have a lot of uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, information who's who's been here. And just, Colin, just another plug. I actually, oh. oh sorry. Yes. Oh, it's silk. Do you want to finish your sentence before I? Oh, I was just. I was just gonna say as a plug, since everyone's like on quarantine now, if you're looking for good books, there are some great ethnographies that are very fun and kind of uh, give you a glimpse into other worlds. So, anyway, um, yes, Paul, no, okay. so I have, um, I think there are three, <laughs> maybe three comments or three questions. Um, one of them was, you mentioned generalizability and um, in talking about qualitative research, especially um, you know ethnography, I was wondering if you are in the generalizability boat, boat or the uh, transferability boat. It's it's in, and I will state my bias in the sense that I have trouble at times um, trying to figure out that generalizability when I'm reading ethnographic um, studies uh, because of the context of um the study itself so I was wondering about your take i think we're probably on the same side of this debate um i i think very much the goal should not be generalizability um uh, and re reproducibility is tied up in there in the sense uh, kind of how i was responding to tj's question um that you never step into the same river twice um, the idea that something is reproducible in this kind of like fine grained detail is a little antithetical to the goals of ethnography from my perspective. Um, but that isn't the same thing as saying that uh, it's completely unfalsifiable. There have been some really good um, return studies, both by the same researcher and by other researchers that have uh, done critical analyses of their their work and actually Colin Turnbull uh, who I mentioned with the forest people also has another book called the mountain people that does I think a very interesting job of this in the the revised introduction where he's gone back to the same society and the first time he did the ethnography was in the middle of a huge famine and drought um, and the world that he came, that he represented in the book was very different from the world that he encountered after the end of the drought when people actually had enough food to survive and the types of like economies that they engaged in were very different. So I think uh, 
Um, that isn't to say that book is also very interesting. It is for, certainly not to say that that book is false for that reason, um, but it shows the deep contextuality of, an, of a good ethnography. Good, thank you, thank you. Um, the other, um, and this is uh, actual, an actual question, you provided um, the VA example. And I have seen <laughs> studies like that pop um, and was wondering in your take or maybe in the community, what's the appropriate period of time? You know, I, I definitely agree to two days doesn't even do any justice, right? That, that should be a case study, not <laughs> an ethnographic mm -hmm. or something else. But I was wondering if, if you had a, a good sense and I'm apologize if I came in a little bit late, but if you had a good sense yeah. of what maybe that period of time. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I think um, just very generally, I would say without any further context for what type of study it is, I, it seems hard to do it in under three months. Um, I remember during my dissertation work, uh, at the three months mark, I was like, oh, I know what my dissertation could be about, you know, and up until that point, I was like, I don't, <laughs> what, what's interest, like, what's really interesting here? What's the key thing I want? Um, I'm sure, I'm sure you could do it in a shorter time period, depending on the types of questions you want to ask and how familiar you already are with uh, a given setting. Um, but really, how are you going to meet the people? Like, like, if the real dream is, you know, that moment where one of your colleagues says, let's grab a beer, you know, not because they're like, I want to meet you, but like, because I'm, you know, like we're kind of friends now. Like if that's the gold standard, how are you going to do that really in under three months? No, I agree. I'm going to leave my last question to give room for others to ask. Okay. Uh, I see Dr. Casper Bauer has his hand up again. I think, TJ, you coming back or was that from before? Sorry, that was from before. I, I wasn't let sure me, how to unraise my hand. Okay. Let me uh, let me jump in. He's got a he's got a cramp. He can't lower his hand. The um, <laughs> yeah, two things. Want to say, Colin? One one thing is in your description of um, participant observer and the and the importance of participation, which is something we don't think about very much in medicine, in terms of research. It's almost um, a a bad thing, right? To think that you're actually going to participate. Um, in your in your study um, with with your participants, you're the researcher, their participants. There's certain ways in which that that's being bridged now within the thoughts about medical research, but I'd say it's it's a important example that that there's a whole body of research, whole tradition of research where participation is so central. It made me think of some of the things the bioethicists do now uh, at the med school, where instead of um, instead of sort of being the, the person who comes, comes in and answers the ethics question and leaves, for a number of teams, we have the ethicist being a, particip a participant observer in the research team uh, because our, our help to them uh, is much more valuable when we, um, when we, uh, when we know their, their work, we know them personally, and we are actually participants in the research rather than just, super, just helicoptering in. So that's a fascinating analogy I hadn't thought of. Um, uh, just the issues that, that Dr. Soto brought up and you brought up, Dr. Haverson, um, about, um, about how much time is enough. I think that's fascinating also, because if you think about the qualitative research that many people do at a med school in comparison to the uh, more in-depth kind of work you're describing, obviously the quality of work we do at a med school and kinds of published in journals like JGIM is usually, and the kind of research you and I both do, is usually much more superficial than anything an ethnographer would do. And of course, the choice of what kind of research to do itself is a scientific question. It's also an ethics question about what's the point of the research and what's your goal of impact in the world. So I wouldn't mind if you have a chance, we're almost out of time, but say a little bit about the choice of what kind of research to do and the depth to go into and how you think about that, about the research you've seen and participated in, which is in so much depth and what that provides versus the research you do and which you're aware of, which is more medical, which is much more superficial, and which is really a stepping stone to something else like an intervention. And I just, it's a very broad question. I'm sure it's a question or a comment, but as you spoke, I really was, was driven back to that sort of question about the purpose of what we do and the purpose of the sort of qualitative 
methods that we often employ, often thought of as just a step to a quantitative study and then an intervention. And there's limitations to that sort of pathway that we rely on. And I think your talk sort of raised that. Uh, so tying that question into uh, how you started, I think one of um, a, both a limitation and a boon of ethnographic research is the um, so for instance you said like this kind of participation which a lot of other methods might view with real skepticism um, on one hand the a large part of my participation was participation on the professional side uh, which is very different um, and uh, and those kinds of concerns simply don't arise in other methods because the assumption is that they, there is a shared professional role. Um, whereas in ethnography, for me, for my ethnography, it was getting my role and that, that role to align, um, those professional roles to align. Uh, the other thing though is one of the things that ethno ethnography does ask you to do that is both problematic and could be very beneficial um, is uh, what could end up being kind of an adv advocacy role uh, for, um, for the patients. So one of the projects I'm working on right now that I hope will expand into something much more like an ethnography um, is working with a patient population that uh, is like desperately underserved um, and uh, dismissed by uh, the healthcare system in large part. Um, especially as a non-clinician, obviously my role isn't to uh, get these patients the care that they need. Um, I can't do that, I don't know what it would be, uh, but is um, allows me a kind of insight and, and, a, and a more in-depth ethnography would allow me uh, a really incredible insight into the types of needs uh, that are being unmet um, and why is the big thing, why these needs are being unmet, uh, kind of living with and living in the skin of um, these kinds of patient populations allows you insight that, uh, that short interviews or that a, a survey wouldn't get you to see what, um, where, where the shortcomings actually uh, are. Fascinating, great. I see the Zoom queen has her hand up again. Uh, Zoom queen, over to you. Um, I am sorry, I was testing you. I don't know how to take it out. Okay. Uh -oh. <laughs> my, my, I'm looking for the opportunity to call on you as Zoom queen because I want to change my, I, um, I do I plan am. to change my title on my Zoom to Zoom. <laughs> I was okay. on two Zooms earlier today, but um, Colin, this may take us on another direction. And I was going to ask specifically about seeing more auto-ethnographic mm -hmm. studies in medical education research that I have had some difficulty seeing as truly auto-ethnographic, um, but yet they're published out there. I think that they probably were better serve as more of a uh, reflective practices, narrative medicine, mm -hmm. you know, like inquiry um, and all those things. And I was just wondering again from um, what do you think about autoethnographic studies in healthcare research or, you know, in this area and what might be the problems in terms of ethics? Yeah. And that might be a whole so other I thing, think, like I said. <laughs> well, I don't think so. I think this is useful because this is one of the ways that people use uh, ethnography as a word um, more than maybe like a technique. Um, and this is not just the case in healthcare. There is, uh, you know, especially since like the 90s in anthropology, there's been a critique of so-called navel gazing ethnographies. Uh, where even if you go out to uh, a community you're not familiar with, the entire ethnography ends up being about your experience. Uh, the, these kinds of autoethnographies of students, um, I've seen some that are, uh, I think, not successful. Um, but then there are some autoethnographies that I think 
go a bit beyond probably what you are kind of uh, highlighting here, where the the um, ethnography doesn't just turn around that individual's experience, but the individual's experience within the context. So like an ethnography of uh, a student going through law school, um, but from the perspective, you know, from the situated perspective of an actual student, but not just limited to that student's perspective, uh, if that makes sense. And I think that's, uh, that's a great way of avoiding those kinds of uh, pratfalls that a lot of people critique as navel gazing or, or just kind of like an opinion piece. Yeah, I, I definitely appreciate it. And maybe it's something for us to explore, I think, in the future um, about how this could be properly applied in, in our areas. And I learned the word navel gazing today. Okay, so that so will be my high, the highlight of my trip. Yes. Okay, well, I guess that... I mean, because again, the, the point of the ethnography is really a culture, not an individual. Although there has been, in my opinion, maybe only one successful ethnography of an individual. And I can share that one with you guys over the list serve too. Did, did you answer, Colin, also whether uh, ethnography is like done at, say, University of Chicago, where, where you were most enmeshed, I guess, in that community? Those definitely do go through the IRB or no? Uh, I can only think, the only reason I can think of why they wouldn't go through the IRB would be if you weren't considering the kind of analysis that's done in an ethnography to be the um, organized formal analysis that's required for something to count as research. But I assume that would be sort of up to the IRB to decide. You'd have to go to them and, and ask them whether the type of analysis you're doing as an anthropologist would count as formal, but I guess it would, and so it would have to go to the IRB. Yeah, um, I, think even, I think even the case that I was mentioning with the, the woman wanting to study the homeless population uh, went to IRB but was considered exempt, probably for the reasons that you're just suggesting. When I was a student, uh, absolutely everything, nothing was considered exempt. Everything, all this kind of ethnographic work went through a full IRB review. Um, and mine was very difficult because of the, the patient side of it. Huh. I had to get, uh, and also multiple institutions too. Like I needed IRB approval from Mayo and from Chicago. Both of them technically required that I have the other's approval first. So, fascinating. That's an interesting question. Okay, great. I guess that's it for our time. This is a burning question for Colin. No, Colin, thank you so much. Uh, My pleasure. We have a great job, Colin. Treats talk in a month. I don't know if Ta is Ta's on. I don't know if he wants to do any advertisement. I think we have something planned for late in May as well. We're trying to keep up our, our uh, schedule here in the uh, treats uh, presentations. And again, we're actually, all these uh, talks along with uh, related literature, which now uh, Colin knows exactly what he'll need to put up here, um, will go up onto a web page for our treats talks. Uh, we're actually very good at getting them up now very quickly. I would think within the week, this should be able to go up. Uh, we have two different ways of posting. Uh, for now, we'll be posting, I believe, uh, actually, I'm not sure. I'll let, I'll let Ta um, Yogo, our program manager, um, uh, let people know how that'll be. They've been posted previously on the Center for Bioethics website. I think they might be, um, in the near future, being posted on the uh, BSAP page, the bioethics website for the CTSI. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Colin.